2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We'll begin reading in verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, what God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now there, or now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, great verses. Love these words. In fact, verse number 17, oft quoted, right? In preaching, out in the world, just talking, Christians talking to each other. Right? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Right? Old things are passed away. Behold. Now, that word behold means it's plainly evident. You can't behold something that's hid, you can't behold something that's on the inside. Okay? You behold things that are made plain in the world. So, what the Apostle Paul was inspired to write, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things are become new. In other words, as verse number 18 would say, God hath reconciled him, us to himself. Right? Well, if you got in, if you were reconciled, you're going to be able to see a difference. Well, what's that word reconciled mean? Well, reconcile, in fact, one of the things I have to do Every day on the job. Right? Reconciling is where there's debts or bills and there are payments, but until you reconcile it, both are still on the books. Right? You've got a chart of, well, people owe us this money or somebody owes this and they paid it. There was a payment, but we haven't taken the payment and applied it to the debt. That's called reconcile, because when you reconcile it, well, there's no need to have either one of them on the books anymore. It goes away in the computer. Because in the computer's mind, for the software that we have, once it's been reconciled, it's gone. Right? Just like it never happened. Everything zeroes out. Right? Well, what's it talking about reconciling here? It means to make whole. Right? To restore unto something's intended state. Right? That's why when you reconcile a cat, you don't have any you know, overpayments over here because they've all been applied to debt. Right? If it's reconciled, it's zero. There's nothing there. Nothing to see. You can open the file, but you're not going to find nothing. Right? So to be reconciled unto God through Christ means first, there was a payment made for sin. Right? It was verse number 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Right, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. First, until that payment is reconciled with your debt. Right, that's the first step in reconciliate. What's that mean? You accepted the payment for your sin. And in somewhere in heaven, where there's a new name written down in glory, God takes the payment of Christ and applies it to your account. Right, and the sin's gone. Not covered up, not moved to a different column, gone. Reconciled. As if it never happened. Right? We are reconciled unto God in salvation. But then, verse number 18 goes on to say, right, He hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So now we see the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. Well, what's the ministry? Christ reconciled all the sins that should ever be, and God imputed them upon him. Right? He that was righteous and holy bore the sins of all of us on the cross and paid for them. Okay? And then, when he got up out of the ground, Christ, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, right? He, he became sin 
But he overcame sin. That's why he can forgive sin. All the sin that was imputed upon Christ, gone. He paid for it. Right? But then again, we've already said, until the payment's been applied, doesn't really matter. But the ministry of reconciliation is going and tell people, payment's already been made, you just have to accept it. What's the word of reconciliation? The testament of everything that he did, how he did it, and that everything that he said, or everything that he promised, he really did say, and he will keep it. The word of reconciliation is the gospel. Okay, but then, it goes on to say, verse number 20, now, the, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Right? Not of Christ, because I'm still in his flesh. He lives in me, but I have not yet attained everything that he's you know, gone to prepare for me. Right? When I get there, I'll look like him, but I don't right now. Okay? I'm on his business. I am not a part of him. Does that make sense? I'm not God. I don't get to decide who hears, who doesn't hear. Right? I am a servant. I've been bought with a price. I'm an ambassador. Right? I've received the adoption of sonship, but I'm also still a servant. Right? I don't get to decide where the gospel needs to go to. I don't get to decide what parts of this I like and I don't like. An ambassador's position is to go and present, if you will, or represent, to another country, a foreign land, what the head of his country would like them to see, like them to hear, like them to be involved in. Right? The president can appoint or remove an ambassador to any country. They are an extension of the executive branch, of the president. So if there's an ambassador that says, well, I'm not going to you know, promote those policies that you want me to promote, gone. Right? The ambassador doesn't get to choose policy. The ambassador lives in a foreign country because he loves his country so much. An ambassador says, if I go to a place that's strange, where I'm a pilgrim, where I'm really never going to belong, and if I go among those that I've never known before, I can better help my country remain or stay the thing that I love so much. Sometimes ambassadors go to foreign countries to offer aid. They say, hey, I've been sent by the government to say, we see what's going on here and we want to help. Sometimes ambassadors show up with a word of warning. They say, hey, everything going on here, that's hurting us. It has a negative impact on us. And because of that, I've come to say, you know, we need to find a way to either stop that or we may have to step in to stop it. Okay, now, how does that translate to us? Well, we were charged with the ministry of reconciliation to go. We were given the word of reconciliation so that it's not words of man, it's words of God. But as ambassadors, we have to go the way that the Lord intends us to go. Sometimes you may have to look at somebody when they ask you, well, what happens if you're not saved when you die? And you may not want to tell them that, well, it's an eternity in hell. Right? They, ambassadors don't like delivering bad news, but there's a reason that, you know, don't shoot the messenger. Right? I was in their shoes long before I ever gave them this bit, but sometimes it takes a wake-up call for somebody to realize that what they've got isn't going to get them through. Other times, it may be an arm of help, friendship. Right? Hey, I've got something that can help you. It's Jesus. Right? Freely given. But then, ambassadors also what's the word? ingratiate themselves into the community. They learn... One, if there's a foreign language, they learn it. Cultures, they learn it because they don't want to offend. Right? They don't want to give anybody any excuse based off of what they do to have a negative impression of the place that they come from. Right? In some areas of the world, right, it's still tradition 
that if it's a state meeting, if you don't take the hand of the first lady or the lady, you know, that's in charge and, you know, offer a kiss on the, the hand, it's considered a great insult, right? Ambassadors learn that so that when they go, they don't offend because they don't want to be the reason that somebody doesn't receive what their homeland wants them to hear, right? Ambassadors often overlooked. Most of the time, they're just the messenger boy. Most of the time, they have to pick up the phone at 2 in the morning when somebody says, hey, this guy has a question about this, and they're the in-between guy. All right, well, here's what they said. Well, here's the answer to that question. Hey, they got another question. Here's the answer to that. Hey, they want to know if we can do this. They're the middleman, right? But they also are of two different lands. They have made themselves a part of the foreign land, but at the same time, their citizenship is somewhere else. They never truly become citizens of the other nation. They never, you know, leave what they love so much to become a part of something that isn't their homeland. Right? That's why they live in embassies most of the time. And you know what embassies are? Under international law, an embassy belongs, the land that it's built on belongs to the country whose embassy it is. Right? You may be in a foreign country, but that doesn't mean that you're living on the foreign country. Right? Jesus already sees us see this, seated in heavenly places. Right? In the mind of God, we're already there. So the place that I stand right now, the place that I make my abode right now, because I've been planted on the rock, that's a part of heaven. Right? I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. But I also can't be ignorant of the fact that worldly people are not spiritual. You can't go and throw the Bible at somebody and expect them to understand it if they've never heard it before. Right? Just like if you were to go to, I don't know, let's pick a random map, Argentina. Some people in Argentina may speak English, but a lot of them don't. I can't just show up and talk in English and expect them to understand it. I may have to learn how to temper or wield the Word of God to whoever's listening to it. Right? So all that in mind, this morning we're just going to talk about the ministry of ministering. Okay, but people often say, what is the ministry? Well, Literally, it's the ministry of reconciliation, but the ministry is to take the gospel. Right? We're all called to that. Look again in verse number 18, right? And hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse number 19, committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse number 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. And it says, as though God did beseech you by us. In other words, when you received this, and you became saved, God called you through the Word to be an ambassador for Him. It's not one of them things that, well, there's a, there's a specialized call for each one of us to take the gospel to other people. Well, there may be a specialized call for somebody to be a missionary to a foreign country, but all of us were called to be ambassadors to the ministry of reconciliation. And again, what is that? That's the gospel. That's taking a lost and dying world, the good news of Christ right so first the ministry of ministering starts with self look again verse number 20 the end of it we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God well hang on a second here we already talked about reconciliation means salvation well that's part of it in order to be reconciled, you have to be saved, but just because you're saved doesn't mean you're reconciled unto God. He's writing to save folk. The church at Corinth saying, we were given the ministry of reconciliation and you received the Word of God. You received Christ as your Savior, but doesn't mean that you're automatically reconciled to God. Again, what is reconciliation? To take all the things that are contrary to one another and cancel them out. Well, what's that mean? Well, I've got this thing called the flesh. And it's contrary to the Spirit. And if I war within myself, 
on what I should do, I'll not do anything. Right? That's why a man cannot serve two masters. He's caught between two opinions. How long halt ye between two opinions, as the Apostle Paul said? Right? How long are you going to sit there and try and make up your mind? Because all the while, you're not doing anything. To be reconciled unto God, no, the word for that would be revival. Not talking about salvation, talking about getting me out of the way so I can be what Christ wants me to be. Allowing Christ to live through us. To reconcile myself to God daily means take up my cross, follow Him. It means to lay down the flesh. I die daily. Why? So that I can be what God wants me to be. The ministry of reconciliation will never be successful if those that take it are not reconciled to God. Okay, if you will, turn with me. Book of 2 Thessalonians. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. I flipped those numbers. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2, just a couple of pages. Okay, 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2, verse number 1. Once you get reconciled, meaning you're in a position where you can take the Word of God. And you know why Paul, you know why Peter, you know why Stephen, before they stoned him, you know why Philip, when he talked to that Ethiopian eunuch as he was sitting there reading the Word of God in the chair, you know why all of them had the power of God on them? Or as the Bible, would sometimes it said that the Spirit would fall upon them and give them unction, right? You know why that happened? Because they were reconciled, right? What do we hear around here all the, all the time? If there's no unity, there's no unction. Well, if there's no unity between your spirit and the spirit of God, you can give the Bible to somebody all day long, but it's not going to hit home. It's not going to get past their ears. Because God cannot use or will not use an unworthy vessel. Right? We submit ourselves and say, Lord, do with me whatever you want to. That's when God will use you. But you can try and be used to God all you want to. Doesn't mean that God's going to be within a mile of it. Right? We know that God's everywhere, but sometimes we try to drag God. Right? I mean, Brother Clint just prayed it not too long ago. Right? Lord, we know you're everywhere, but help us understand that you're right here. Right? right? We try to take God with us and say, well, I'm going to, you know, give them the gospel. I'm going to make sure that they hear today. That's not my job. What's my job? My job is to be an ambassador. I deliver the message when the one who tells me says, go deliver the message. Right? I, although I say, hey, Lord, if you just let me go at them again, I'm pretty sure I could get them this time. But I think I could convince them. Right? Y'all do understand that by nature, I'm an arguer. Yeah. I can't help it. Somebody will say something and I'll just be like, no, that's not true. Why? Because I care enough about truth that I want people to know it. Right? Even if it's over something silly. Right? And somebody one time said, why do you do that all the time? Because if you're going to say something, you might as well say the right thing. Right? What's the point in knowing if you just let everybody else go around and think whatever they want to think? Right? But that, in the flesh, I've got a desire a lot of times to say, well, hang on, let's, you know, bust open a doctrinal seminary here and just uh, show this person all the ways that they're wrong. What's that going to accomplish? If I'm successful, right, it belittles them. Right? But there is a way that you can go and take the truth and humbly, right, treating it as an honor that I get to be the one that God chose to take the gospel to somebody. And you do it in such a reverential way that when you leave, God can take what you said, that word fitly spoken, and he's going to work on their hearts long after you're gone. In the wee hours of the morning, he may wake them up with what you said on their mind. And then by the time you come to work the next day, they got a hundred questions. Right? But answering all the questions before somebody asked it isn't going to accomplish anything. I have to be reconciled to go the right way. Why? Because of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Look at verse number 1. 
For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. In other words, God used us, and we weren't just talking for no reason. Right? We had unction. We had power from God. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. In other words, they knew that people weren't going to like it. And even though they knew, well, who is we, by the way? Well, Paul Silas, Philippi, they's thrown in prison. God sent an earthquake, opened up all the jail cells and all the shackles. And then the Philippian jailer got saved. Right? Why did that happen? Because they were reconciled to God. If they were there on their own accord trying to make a name for themselves, God wouldn't have opened the jail cells. Right? Because they got, what did the Pharisee who prayed out loud in the temple, he got his reward. He got the acclaim of men. A lot of people would have said back in Jerusalem, well, hey, Paul's out there. They're throwing him in prison and everything else because he's just out there preaching the gospel. Doesn't mean that God's in it. Right? I can go and make a whole lot of people angry. Doesn't mean that that's going to be, you know, God in it. Right? You want an example? Look at the, what's the name? Westboro Baptist Church. Right? Them idiots, there's like 12 people in the whole church. All of them are related. And then when most of them turn 18, they get out of the church. Why is that? Well, because they do goofy things like take signs and boycott military funerals because the military allows gay people in the military. Not the time or the place. Right? Not the best way to get your message across. But they teach anything. Just to, you know, get out there and to be seen to get the word out. Mm, that doesn't always work. Okay, they're the ones that they'll bust in, you know, 150 people to a movie and they'll boycott out front of it for four, four weeks before the movie even opens. Right? And then those that, again, spiritually uneducated, they look at them and say, them people are a whole bunch of crazies. And then they look at people like us and they say, well, you claim to be one of them. You must be crazy. Right? Just because there's going to be contention doesn't mean there has to be contention. God will take care of the naysayers. The Apostle Paul said, we knew there was going to be contention, but we went anyway because we knew that there'd be some that received it. Second step in the ministry of ministering, right? When you take the, the gospel, it's not about those that don't receive, it's about those that do. Paul's not writing to those that got angry at him. He's not writing to those that wanted to argue with him. Who's he writing to? Those that received it. He says, we came in and were bold in our God to speak unto you. Verse number 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanliness, nor in guile. Well, what's that mean? Well, we didn't show up in deceit to try and hoodwink you. I mean, we can go back to verse number 2. But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully, shamefully entreated, as ye know. These people had heard about Paul. Everything that had happened to him. Right? They knew that this guy had made a reputation for himself, and really it wasn't him. God had given him the reputation of everywhere this guy goes, people get help, and then the people that you know, don't want to get help, they get angry. Right? They knew that this guy had been in prison. They knew that this man had been beaten and had been stoned. Right? They knew what had happened, but he didn't come in to see. He didn't show up like Joel and say, hey, every day's going to be a Friday. Weren't you just in jail last Friday? Well, yeah, but it was pretty sunny on the inside of that jail. So none of that. Not guile. What's guile? That means speaking out of both sides of your mouth. Not speaking to make both, both groups happy or appease both groups so that they don't throw you in jail a second time. It means not watering down the truth. But then finally, nor of uncleanliness. None of that. Well, you can come to God and live however you want to after you get saved. Or show up and look like a bum, right? Talk like a bum, act like a bum. Because again, what is that? I am an ambassador. Those people aren't ever going to go and look at the things of God and then come back 
and say, okay, we know what the things of God are, uh, so we can disregard what you look like and what you act like. People don't know what godliness, holiness, righteousness looks like, but they do know that we claim to be from somewhere where all those things exist. So if somebody looks at me and says, well, you're supposed to be a god, but you look and act like the world. Why do I want what you have if you're the same as me? Right? The Apostle Paul showed up. They looked, I mean, where was it? It was over in Greece. He started pre- they thought that he was Mercury, or in other words, Hermes in Greek mythology, Mercury in Roman mythology, and then they thought that Silas, Jupiter thought he was king of the gods. Why? Because they knew hey, there's something different about them boys. When they talk, God's all over them. They didn't know God. They tried to make their own gods, but they recognized they have authority from a higher power. You think that would have happened if they showed up in uncleanliness, lasciviousness, speaking in guile or deceit? No. We do what we do, not for our sake, but for the sake of the gospel. I live the way that I live because I love my Lord. And because I love Him, I will take the gospel that He entrusted unto us and called us to take. I'll take it to others, but I'll take it in such a manner that it doesn't bring dishonor unto Him. But what would you think if somebody sent an ambassador? What would you think if the governor recanted and repented of all the evils that he has done? and sent an ambassador to the church to apologize. Okay? And the guy showed up covered in motor oil, right? Had, you know, maybe smoking a cigar. Comes in barefoot, right? He's got mud up to his knees, and he says, yeah, I'm here from the governor. I think the governor doesn't care too much about what we think about him. And I know that already. But, what kind of impression would that make? Or if somebody comes in, and yeah, they might be, you know, from the cut of the sleazy politician, right? But they may come in, and they may be in their finest apparel, right? Suits that are too expensive for any of us to afford, right? Shoes handmade in the U.S., right? If that guy shows up, but at least he sent somebody that's respectable, right? Well, what do you think that the world thinks when we're all down in the dump well I would tell you about Jesus but I don't want to get thrown in jail again I don't want people to think about me funny or yeah Jesus is great on Sundays but you know Monday through Saturday that's my time I would grow in the nurture and admonition of God but I'm just kind of happy with where I'm at right now what kind of testament is that to those that were sent to because whether you tell them or not, you're still a written epistle, known and read of all men. The Apostle Paul said, we go in a certain way because we are reconciled, right? Because we're holy gods, right? Because we choose daily to devote our life unto Him. But when we go to give the gospel of reconciliation, right? When we go to tell people, you too can have what I have, it's something that they actually want because God rewards obedience. I can't do what God wants me to do my way. God to do it His way. Right? I mean, Christian will tell you. I'll use him as an example. I've said this before. You can do the right thing the wrong way. Right? He could pull somebody over and arrest them to later find out that they had a whole bunch of drugs in the trunk. But if that were the case, that guy's going to get let go because he went about it the wrong way. Right? You've got to have probable cause. And then in some situations, probable cause only gets you enough for a search warrant so that you can go and actually search for what you're looking for. That there are right ways to do things, and the way that you're supposed to do them is the right way, because if you do it the right way, it can't be undone. It can't be critiqued. Part of the ministry of reconciliation is going in such a way that they can't hold what we do against God. Right? Some people will be able to stand before the throne and say, Lord, 
the person that you sent to me didn't live the life that they were supposed to. You know what's going to happen? That person's blood will be required at the hands of the one that didn't do right. Because we offended. God never offended anybody. The truth may, as you know, the verse says, cause contention. Right? But most of the time you tell somebody the truth, they're going to be thankful for it. Unless they've been brainwashed and think that these masks actually work. It's, I'm there. I'll say it. Three or four months ago, CDC, World Health Organization, come out. Can't get it from surface contact. How come we're still spraying everything after somebody touches it? Right? Two weeks ago, they said that asymptomatic people can't spread it. So unless you got a fever, why are you wearing a mask? It just makes sense. And then they backpedaled real quick because people caught on. And they said, oh, no, no, that's not what we meant. And then they phrased it a different way that was more confusing, and that's what it says. And then there was a study, you know the N95 respirators that people use when they're painting? Those things are like 99% effective. Paper surgical mask, 33% effective. But yet, oh no, that's good enough. Well, 33% of the time, if you could spread it, it may stop you from getting it. But no, everybody got to do it. And not for 14 days. Going on 170 days. Whole bunch of nonsense. You know why nobody cares about what Fauci says? Because when he went, people were like, hey, aren't you corrupt? And they looked at his history. You know why people don't care what Joe Biden has to say? Look at his history. You know why? C SPAN all week long, people are calling in. I used to vote Democrat, but now I'm not. Because they said, these people have gone nuts. They said, they left us behind, and the only place we got left to go is Trump. Or they're not going to vote at all, which still helps Trump. Right? You want to know why last week Trump got a 9% boost in the Afri African American voter population of swing states? Because people looked at him and said, I believe that he actually believes what he's saying. He may not say it the best way. Right? He'd be a whole lot more popular. He'd get a whole lot more votes if he was just a little bit more, you know, presentable. But the guy grew. He, he worked in the construction business in New York. Go talk to any construction worker in New York. Right? He's tame. Right? But that's the way he talked for years to get stuff done. Right? Can't te teach an old dog new tricks. I get that. You may not like the way he talks. may not like the way that he acts. But I believe that he believes what he says. Right? Well, if I go and I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, they know that I don't believe what I'm saying. People can spot a phony. Kids can spot phonies. They'll look at a guy and be like, that guy's weird. Right? He's too happy all the time. He's putting on a fake... You, you ever see those people that as soon as they see a kid, they start talking in a different voice? Kids don't like those people. Why? Because they know they're fake. Right? You know, you ever wonder why babies start crying when somebody... Happy, happy, happy. They don't like it. They were like, I just heard you talk a few seconds. That, that's not normal. They get that. Right? Well, the world can spot whether or not we really believe what we're saying we believe. Right? But the next part of reconciliation, okay, verse number four, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... That means God said, I'm giving you something valuable because I believe that if you do what I say, well, he knows, that if we do what he says we'll do, more value will come from the gospel. But we were put in trust. We don't own it, but we are charged with keeping it. Meaning not changing it, because the Apostle Paul didn't add to or take away anything. He gave it to them as God gave it to him. Right? Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. In other words, how are you going to speak as God which trieth the hearts if you're ignoring what God's going to have you do in your life so that you can be more presentable or reconciled unto Him? Right? You cannot preach, teach, or just give the gospel to somebody else if you're not living 
what you're trying to tell that person. Right? Most of the time, you're not going to tell them because it reminds you of what you should be doing. Right? But then, verse number 5, For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. In other words, we didn't come trying to butter you up, trying to get all buddy-buddy with you. If you asked us, we told you. We would preach Jesus, and if you inquired, we'd give you the truth. Not covetousness, not going to say, well, hey, keep in mind, the Apostle Paul had the ability to heal people. He didn't go and say, I'll heal you if you let me stay at your house tonight. Right? Well, I don't know anybody in this town, can't really speak to... He also had the ability to speak in tongues, so this situation didn't happen. Okay? But, well, I don't know the language. I'll heal you if you'll be my interpreter. Okay? I'll heal you if you just stop giving me such a bad time on the job. Right? I'll heal you if you go back and take back and apologize all them things that you did to hurt me all them years ago. Nope. Whoever came. I mean, but James' song and his verse. Whosoever. Who's that mean? It means them. That the one that you're thinking of, well, I hope that never person comes and adds. No, 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 no. It means them. Well, I don't know if I'd ever be able to give the gospel to that, but it means them. Right? Well, surely God could use somebody else. Yeah, but if he uses you, it means them. Because an ambassador doesn't get his emotions involved. He's concerned with what the person that sent him with, or sent him, is concerned with. Right? Well, he also says, Nor of men sought we glory. I don't want your praise. I want you to praise God for what God did in your life. I don't want your recognition. I mean, we may, as members of the family of God, become close afterwards. In fact, you know, he writes later on in this book that it's killing him because he can't get back to see him because right now he's off on another mission field. He says, I desire that I'd see y'all face to face. He's saying, I love y'all. Why? Because that's part of his family. We may get close afterwards, but I'm not in it so that you and I become friends. But God will give you friends in the family of God. Because you've got a kindred spirit. And you get around that person and you think, hey, that person's going to the same place that I'm going. He knows just everything that I know about God. And we both love it. So why not spend time with that guy? Why do you think the Apostle Paul took people that he called his uh, fellow laborers in Christ like Luke the physician right he took Barnabas he took Silas right at one point he writes send Mark unto me for he's profitable for the ministry that was somebody that did him wrong before and he said bring Mark because he says it's not about what happens to me it's about God getting the glory he says God can use Mark just like God uses me so bring Mark with you he said it's not about man's approval rating he says we did what God said was right and we did it the way that God said it because we cared for your souls but then nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ in other words if somebody out there who doesn't know God and you're trying to give them the gospel if there's something that you could ask them for but it would do detriment to the ministry because they think of you as a freeloader or an Indian giver or somebody that is just trying to get near, swindle them, right? You're going to blow out in the middle of the night and take whatever you get? He said, no, no, no. We didn't even want to be a burden, an inconvenience. He's saying, I didn't ask you all for a place to stay because I knew that God knew where I was going to stay. He said, but I also didn't want you all to think that I was just giving you the gospel so that I'd have a place to sleep that night. That's why the Apostle Paul mended nets. You'll find that he did that often. You know why? Make a little bit of money. Maybe to go get some food. Maybe just to stay on one of the ships of the fishermen that night when they weren't using it. But he said, 
I went out of the way to not be a burden unto people. He said, the last thing I wanted was when they saw Paul coming down the road that they'd say, oh great, here's this guy again. Right, what's he want this time? What's he in, you know, why is he coming by this way now? He's saying, I didn't want anything from you. I wanted to give you everything that I had. But when we become a nuisance to others, a burden unto other people, right? Why do you think when we go out on visit, we don't stand there and knock on the door till somebody opens, right? I just say, well, if I knock long enough, they'll get annoyed and they'll come and answer the door. Yeah, that's a great way to start off. Hey, can I tell you about Jesus? But if somebody's out on their lawn and they're saying, well, hey, what's this? And they start up, of course we'll be cordial. Right? Of course we'll be friendly. Right? And we'll treat them with all respect and honor. Why? Because Jesus died for that person. He thought they were pretty valuable. But we're not going to be a burden. Why? Because that does harm to the name of Christ. Christ doesn't need anything from anybody. But he does want to use people to reach other people. And if I'm the reason that another person can't be reached by God, not God's fault, not their fault, it's my fault. But I'm also failing as an ambassador of Christ. But then, he goes on to say in verse number 7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. People going to have goofy questions. Things that you've never heard before. Well, I was always told this. You know the worst thing you can do? <laughs> That's hogwash. Because in their mind, you've just written off everything that they were raised on. What did he say? We were gentle among you. Right? Well, and I've done this. Well, I've never heard that before. But I can tell you what the Bible says about it. Why? Because this is the word of reconciliation. Nobody going to get saved out of any other book than this one. Not going to get saved unless the spirit that wrote this book deals with their heart. Right? But if you can give them the answers, not of man's opinion, but of God's. What's a nurse's, or in this point, it'd be a babysitter's job. It's not their job to be the parent. What's their job? What's well, to give them the food that the parent gave unto them? Right? And as much as you may not think this, all the photos of me as a baby, I was a bowling ball. Because I was the first kid. I was the experiment. Every time I cried, they fed me. Okay? And then they found out with Christian and Sydney, well, every time he cries, he's not always hungry. Right? And that's why they didn't look like that. But a babysitter, I don't know how to save somebody. I don't know how to, you know, take care of a child. It's not my child. I don't know what I'm doing here, Lord. Well, just take them what I told you to take them. Right? Care for them the best that you can in tenderness, in gentleness. Right? The Lord was lowly and he was humble, but that didn't mean that he, did, that he lacked power that he lacked the ability to speak right to somebody's heart. In fact, several times he started talking, and they wanted to kill him right then and there. And then him being God, he just slipped out from among them. And then they didn't know where he went. Right? But he never said it in an accusatory manner. He spoke caring, someone that loved them. Somebody can yell at me all day long, and if I know that they hate me, and then I'm not going to change their opinion... I don't care what they say. You know when you care about what somebody says? When you know that they're saying it because they really believe it and because they believe that it'll help you. Those are the things that, if it goes contrary to what you think, it'll offend you. That's why they say don't talk about politics at the dinner table because you want your family not to be idiots and then you start arguing with them over why they're idiots. Right? Because you care about the opinions of people that love you and that you love. And people know, well, if they care, I'll ask them. Well, what about this? What about that? Right? The answer may not always be the easiest pill to swallow, 
But there are ways that you can give a baby medicine besides making it swallow, you know, 800 milligram Advil, right? They do make liquid medicine, right, just for children. They can't swallow pills yet. There are ways that you can gently give someone things that you know are going to pierce right to their heart, that it's going to hit them. But you also know that when you go to the doctor, if you've got a nail sticking out of your foot, it's going to hurt to get the nail taken out, but it'll be better in the long run. The doctor says, hey, this is going to hurt a little bit, but he doesn't apologize. You know why? Because he knows that what he's getting ready to do, it's going to hurt, but you're going to get better. But what is this? This is a sharp two-edged sword, but it is also the balm of Gilead for people's soul. Right then, verse number 8, he says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. He says, Every time that I told somebody about the gospel, I imparted part of my very soul into that. I invested myself into that person. He said, I didn't just go out and preach and then say, Well, Lord, it's up to you on whether or not they get saved. He's saying it didn't matter what time of the day. Didn't matter whether it was raining or whether it was sunshine. Didn't matter if they came at a convenient time or an inconvenient time. Didn't matter if there were people that said, hey, if you tell that person about Jesus, we're going to take you and arrest you. It said, didn't matter about circumstance. I care for them dearly because Christ dearly cares for them. And I'm not just imparting the word of reconciliation. He's saying, to show that I'm serious, I imparted my very soul. He's saying, I learned names. Right? You really think you're going to be an effect, effective witness for somebody? Oh, yeah, I remember running you the other week. Uh, what was your name? Yeah, it really shows that you care about that person. Right? You may not get first and last name, but, oh, yeah, you're so-and-so. Yeah, I do remember talking to you. Right? You know what? everything that we just read I mean verse number 9 and you remember brethren are to labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you we preached unto you the gospel of God when he says that we would not be chargeable he's saying I didn't want to give you the excuse that well the man of God you know I worked third shift and the man of God wouldn't come to me when I was available Right Or, they asked at an inconvenient time. Right? Well, I can always grab a bite to eat later. If somebody wants to know about Jesus, I can stand being hungry for a little bit. He says, because I didn't want you to be able to stand before God and say, He did something wrong. But really what he's saying is, I didn't want to be the reason you died and, went to go, or died and had to go to hell that you went to everlasting damnation and torment because it was inconvenient for me. If you truly care, little things like that, they don't get in the way. But an ambassador doesn't get the privilege of, oh man, that foreign country's calling me again. I think I'll just ignore it this time. No, he has to pick up the phone because it's not getting back to the, you know, the king or the president or whoever sent him if he doesn't answer the phone call. Well, the king could always say, well, that wasn't my fault. He didn't pick up the phone, which is what would happen at the judgment seat. I'd be standing there and he'd say, it was your fault, not mine. But that doesn't change the fact that somebody was trying to get to the king and didn't know how to except through me. The apostle Paul saying, I took it so serious, I put more of myself into others than I did into my own self. He's saying, I didn't care about what I wanted. I cared about what other people needed and what God wanted me to do. Being reconciled unto God is, y'all don't have to go there, but I'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. It says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, have given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, 
and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. He's saying, the Lord went back to glory, sent the Comforter. He said it was better to have the Comforter than for Him to stay here on the earth. Okay, so Holy Ghost, pretty good deal. In the very words of Jesus, it's better that the Holy Spirit come and indwell men than Jesus still be walking on the earth. Pretty good deal. But the Apostle Paul wrote, we pray you in Christ's stead. Initially, there was one that would take the word of reconciliation. That was Christ. But when you were given the ministry of reconciliation, that means that God said, it's your turn to put on the shoes of Christ and take the gospel to others. And the Apostle Paul said, instead of praying that Christ would get a hold of them, I'm praying that you'd go out and get a hold of them. Because Christ lives in you through the Holy Spirit. Right? The whole thing boils down to three. And then, we didn't have to, I ran out of time, I went long. But then there's the ministry of reconciliation for those that are in, but they got out. You know how we do that? Same way we take the gospel to lost people. We care for them. We are gentle. Right? We don't judge. Instead, we seek to restore or reconcile, to put something back where it belongs. The ministry of reconciliation is why God saved you. It's how God saved you. And it's what God called us all to do. But it starts with reconciling ourselves to God, reconciling our flesh to God. And then, when we go, we take the word of reconciliation. Not as somebody that has a secret. It's free for all to know. But I should also be able to stand before them, whether I've got this in my hand or not, and be able to give them what God said about it. Because there's no guarantee that Philip would have ever passed that Ethiopian eunuch a second time. No guarantee that as Peter and John went into the temple, if they wouldn't have healed that man that was lame, right? No guarantee that he would have been there the next time. Right? Paul told Timothy, be instant in season and out of season. He wrote that to a preacher talking about preaching. But everyone should be able to take the word of reconciliation and instant in season, out of season, be able to give an answer unto somebody else on why they need what God gave you. You know how that starts? Reconciling our whole heart, mind, and soul unto God. You know why God sends revival? So that people go out and reconcile people. You know when God sends revival? When people are so concerned about reconciling people back to God that they give up everything that they didn't have or that God wanted so that they could be used of God. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.